In the last lecture, we were focused on um, the government's response to the crisis that was the Great Depression. And we found out that, uh, you know, the, the two sp presidencies that spanned across the Depression, uh, Hoover and Roosevelt, they had very different approaches to dealing with this Depression. Um, whereas Herbert Hoover really was very reluctant to provide uh, bold action from the government, Roosevelt was willing to experiment, to try new things, to uh, you know, invent programs that were designed to at least address the suffering of the American people. And in that respect, the American people very much appreciated him for that. He was one of the more uh, popular presidents in American history in, when it comes to elections alone. Now, today what I want to talk about is more or less the long-term impact of what we call the Second New Deal, um, uh, the last time we met. Uh, those of you that have been following on closely, you'll know that the First New Deal uh, was struck down by the Supreme Court in 1935. It was deemed to be unconstitutional. And so the Second New Deal, um, it, 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 it grows out of the ashes of uh, the, the, the original one. And it really emphasizes social justice. I want to start in 1937. 1937 is a very important year for a number of different reasons, but this is two years deep into the emergence of the Second New Deal. Now, it's in that year that Roosevelt begins to try to take on what he considers to be his political enemies, and this does not exactly go very well for Roosevelt. Now, as you might imagine, one of the first uh, enemies of the Roosevelt administration was the Supreme Court. And what Roosevelt was worried about was that the Supreme Court was going to do to the Wagner Act and the Social Security Act, uh, the WPA, um, it was going to do to those new Second New Deal programs what it had done to the First New Deal, deem them to be unconstitutional and kind of send everyone back to the drawing board. And so what he tried to do in 1937 is pack the Supreme Court full of New Deal justices, appoint justices that kind of viewed the world the same way that Roosevelt did, even before a currently sitting Supreme Court justice retired or died while on the bench. Um, this became scandalous very, very quickly, and it became pretty obvious what Roosevelt was trying to do. He was trying to pack the court with his supporters, and it became known as the Supreme Court Packing Crisis in 1937. Now, from a public relations standpoint, this does not look very good for the Roosevelt administration. It looks almost like a dictator, but it's also sending a very stern message to the Supreme Court. Do not mess around with my New Deal programs. These are designed to um, uh, lift the country out of the Great Depression. Uh, your job is to say what the law is, not knock down laws or create laws of your own. So know your place and stay there. Okay, And it, to that end, this Supreme Court packing crisis, if there is a silver lining, that was a silver lining. Throughout the rest of what can be considered the New Deal era, uh, the Supreme Court was so frightened by the Roosevelt administration that it said, look, we're just not even going to touch this stuff. So they, they don't knock down the Wagner Act. They don't knock down the Social Security Act. They pretty much leave it alone. Okay. Now, another bit of bad news for the Roosevelt administration in 1937 was the recession. Um, it's called the Roosevelt Recession because it happens on his watch. Uh, but the reason that it happens is Roosevelt in 37 tries to back away from so much direct government involvement in the economy. Uh, he is taking a lot of criticism on the political right for spending too much money. Uh, they're calling him irresponsible. How is this going to be paid for? And so by 1937, he says, maybe we have achieved a point where we don't have to spend so much governmental money on these New Deal programs. But when he does that, when the government money goes away, the economy falls flat on its face. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or Republican, if you're popular, if you're unpopular, if you're in the White House at the time that a recession hits, you're, you're going to take some heat for it. So the Roosevelt recession really does take a lot of the punch out of the New Deal uh, by 1937. 1938 um, is a midterm election year. Now, Roosevelt's not running for election, but uh, people in the Senate, Congress, and uh, governor's races are running. And what Roosevelt decides he's going to do in 1938 is take on some of his political enemies within the Democratic Party, his own party. Now, um, some of these Democrats uh, have been teaming up with Republicans uh, 
to try to oppose the progress of the New Deal. Well, Roosevelt says enough is enough. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my New Deal candidates. I'm going to support people that view the world the way that I do. I'm going to run those people uh, next to you. They're going to get FaceTime with the president. They're going to spend a lot of money and a lot of time campaigning for them. And we're going to get you out of office. Well, it backfires. It does not work. And not only do these conservative Democrats uh, survive their reelection campaigns, they once more team up with Republicans and, and pretty much halt the, halt the expansion of the New Deal. Okay, So through these three issues, the court packing crisis, the Roosevelt recession, and the uh, failure of FDR's political purge, by 1939, what I need you to understand is that the New Deal is basically dead. Right? You don't see the kind of rapid legislation that's coming out in 1939, the same way that you saw in 1933, 1934, 1935, okay? Um, that's not to say that the New Deal would not make a lasting legacy uh, in American history. The next issue that we need to talk about is the socio-political impact of the New Deal, and I want to start with organized labor. Now, those of you that viewed the last lecture know that the Wagner Act gave workers the right to form unions and force their employers to bargain collectively with them. It also issued in a new approach to union organizing. Now, if you think back to the beginning of the class, the institution that is taking the lead when it comes to organizing the workers is the American Federation of Labor, which emphasizes craft unions, right? Uh, in order to be a member of the AFL, you pretty much had to be a man. You had to be white, you had to be native-born, and you had to be a skilled worker. A cigar roller, a blacksmith, a butcher, something along those lines. Well, you can imagine by 1937, that's not the vast majority of the American working class. Most of the people that would be considered working class would be unskilled workers. Most of them would be of immigrant birth or at least immigrant parentage. Many of them are workers. Um, these are not people that the AFL is going to take a huge interest in. Out of this development, we see the emergence of something called the Congress on Industrial Organizations, the CIO. And the leader of the CIO is a guy that was the president of the Coal Miners Union, a guy by the name of John L. Lewis. And the approach to union organizing that Lewis has is let's organize workers not by what they do, not let's not organize the pipe fitters and the millwrights and the electricians. Let's go ahead and just organize everybody in the steel factory as part of the United Steel Workers. Everybody that's an auto worker, doesn't matter what you do inside the auto shop, right? You are going to belong to the United Automobile Workers. It's called industrial unionism organizing the basic industries of the United States based on uh, an industry-by-industry -industry basis. Now, think about who comprises the vast majority of workers in these industries. They're predominantly unskilled workers. They're predominantly either of immigrant birth or parentage. Um, they're women. They're people of color. Uh, they're religious ethnic minorities. And so in order to get them to buy into unionism, in order to get them to sign up and to pay part of their hard-earned money to their union dues, you're going to have to give them something that they want. Right? This can't just be exclusively about native-born white men. It's not going to work if that's going to be the case. So generally what the CIO becomes is an outlet for civil rights. And I, I want you to write that down. The CIO is about getting better pay. It's about getting shorter work hours. It's about getting better working conditions. But it's also a voice for the workers, many of whom are immigrants, many of whom are women, many of whom are people of color. It's a voice for them to address the issue that is civil rights. Okay. So if you're going to get work, women workers to sign up for the union, you're going to have to have a clause that says, look, the best man or woman for the job will get the job, will get the promotion. Um, if a black man does the exact same job as a white man inside the factory, the pay is exactly the same. Um, when it comes to who gets laid off first, uh, race, ethnicity, religiosity, sex, has nothing to do with it, right? It has everything to do with who has been there first, who has the most amount of seniority. So as you can see, 
Um, the CIO and the approach that it has to industrial organizing is not only very inclusive, it's a platform to launch a broader movement that's going to include more and more Americans, including people of color, including women, including racial, ethnic, religious minorities. Okay. Now, it's one thing to talk about organizing. It's another thing to get your company to actually acknowledge that your union exists and bargain collectively with it. Now, similar to the Brown versus Board of Education decision that will come out in the 1950s, when, the, when, when Congress passes the Wagner Act in 1935, all your big companies ignored it. General Motors just pretty much pretended like it didn't exist. Uh, U.S. Steel, the same kind of deal. Right? So anyway, um, if this is going to mean anything, it's going to be up to the workers to force the issue with the companies. Now think back to the beginning of our class when I was talking about the Homestead strike or the Pullman strike. Every time that you saw workers walk off the job, what happened to them? They were replaced by replacement workers. The company escorted replacement workers in. They did the job just as good as the, the workers that had walked away from their jobs. And the strike was broken. So if this is going to work, you're not going to be able to employ that tried and tested approach of just walking off the job. So what workers began doing in 1937 is sitting down inside the factory. Instead of walking outside the factory, they locked themselves inside and they occupied it. Now, the most important example that I can give you to this end occurs in Flint, Michigan in the late winter of 1936 and into the early uh, winter months of 1937 at the General Motors plant in Flint, Michigan. Now, um, the thing that I need you to be mindful of when it comes to the sit-down strike is that the corporations, including General Motors, considered this to be um, illegal. They considered it to be trespassing. Those workers were occupying space that the company said they didn't have a right to occupy, and they told the uh, Flint Police Department to evict them. They told the, um, uh, the, the, the governor of Michigan that uh, in order to protect GM's property, they needed to evict the workers. The state of Michigan does not evict the workers, and what this does is it forces General Motors' hand. Because although this was only one factory, it made parts and it made um, um, equipment for the entire General Motors Corporation. And so the, the point is General Motors can't now run its industrial empire. It, it can't get parts, it can't get equipment to various other parts of its country, other, other parts of its empire, and it begins to crack apart. And so General Motors has a choice to make. You either bargain collectively with the workers and acknowledge their union, or you lose more market share to Chrysler and to Ford. And that's ultimately what happens in 1937, is the sit-down strikers win union recognition. General Motors officially recognizes the United Automobile Workers, and they agree to bargain collectively. So the workers now have formed a union. And this follows by incidents in places like Western Pennsylvania with U.S. Steel, Chicago with U.S. Steel, uh, Chrysler a few months later, it's going to take a little while, but Henry Ford, General Electric, DuPont Chemical, uh, um, U.S. Rubber, uh, basically the, um, the, the, the core of America's uh, in industries has been organized by the time 1939 ends. Okay? Now the significance of enforcing the Wagner Act is actually quite simple. What this is saying is the government, for the first time in American history, has a vested interest in uh, the common people, the working class. And the working class has a vested interest in their government. They believe, they're, they're beginning to believe more and more that it's their government. Okay. Um, so the important aspect of this, you know, the, the Wagner Act, is, is not only that it's giving uh, racial, ethnic, religious minorities, a sounding board for civil rights. It's about giving workers who had heretofore been really excluded from the small-d democratic process in the United States, it's giving them a political voice and it's giving them more political power. In short, it's, it's really including industrial workers into the mainstream fold of the United States. Now to that end, women uh, are included much more uh, during and after the New Deal than before that time period, okay? Now what I mean is women become far, far more visible, both in, in the American public, but also especially in American politics.
Um, example, um, Francis Perkins was appointed the Secretary of Labor uh, by the Roosevelt administration. And the reason that this is important is she's one of the first um, female cabinet members to ever be appointed by a sitting president. So clearly the times are changing when it comes to not only women doing things like voting, but women making really important decisions in the American political scene. Uh, Molly Dusen uh, became the Women's Division Chair of the Democratic National Committee. But the really big name that I want you to be mindful of here would be Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, as you might imagine, Eleanor Roosevelt was the First Lady. She was the wife of Franklin Roosevelt. And, um, you know, it, it's not as if other First Ladies hadn't had a public, you know, presence. Um, certainly, Mary Todd Lincoln was known other first ladies were known, but nobody was as active uh, in terms of actually implementing change than Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, Eleanor would do things like tour uh, coal mining camps, and, and then she would tell her husband, you must address this issue with the coal miners. Um, she, she, she read letters from Southern black families that had been writing to her saying, you need to get your husband to commute the sentence of uh, my brother, my son, my husband. Uh, he's been sentenced to death for a crime that he didn't commit in Georgia. So um, she would petition her husband to try to get an anti-lynching bill. Um, it was unsuccessful, but you know she's, she's very active in this. But the most important thing that I think you can walk away from Eleanor Roosevelt um, understanding is her column that appeared in newspapers across the country entitled My Day. And this was Eleanor Roosevelt uh, basically outlining her political orientation, what should be done, what still needs to be worked on, what, what progress is still out there that needs to be made. And this is important because up until this point, this is not really something that women did. I mean, women are assuming a more public presence in the 1920s, but certainly not all that political oriented. Eleanor Roosevelt is very much changing that. And we can see that through her My Day columns that appeared in newspapers all across the United States. Now, if there's nothing else that you walk away from this um, lecture understanding, I, I want you to understand that the New Deal ushered in a culture of inclusion for millions of Americans that had kind of been on the outside looking in up until this point. Now, one of the other instances that we see this is the WPA, the Work Progress Administration. Now, what the Works Progress Administration did was it built roads and bridges, schools, a lot of airports traced their origins back to the WPA. But it did so on an equal basis. In other words, race, ethnicity, gender, um, these things were not really taken into consideration uh, when it comes to who got the jobs. Okay, I'll give you a quick example. Um, African Americans represented approximately 13% of the population uh, throughout most of the 1930s, but they received over 33% of the jobs uh, when it comes to the WPA jobs. Um, Mexican Americans were generally included in the mainstream American fold. Um, it wasn't as if they uh, got more um, funding, but there was more funding to go around for more and more of these individuals. So those vicious deportation campaigns that we were talking about uh, uh, in the early 1930s, they generally subsided. In 1934, uh, uh, the Roosevelt administration lifted one of the ugliest stains on American history. Uh, the Native, um, uh, the Indian Re Reorganization Act basically lifted the Dawes Act that said the government could not only buy Native American land whenever it wanted to, uh, Native Americans really couldn't do much about the resistance of that. In 1943, uh, the Chinese Exclusion Act came to an end, and so Asian Americans, predominantly from China, were uh, opened up and uh, were now allowed to come to the United States. Uh, 1934, the Tiding McDuffie Act gave the Philippines back to the indigenous population of the Philippines, so the, the Filipinos. And so you can see that there's a general culture of inclusion, whether you're talking about African Americans, Mexican Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, all of these people see something coming from their government. And very similar to workers, it demonstrates that their government cares about them. Okay.
Now, one of the last things that I want to talk about um, is the issue of environmentalism. In the 1930s, you have one of the most ecologically devastating um, uh, um, examples of uh, climate change in, in, in human history. Um, during the war years, World War I, I mean, uh, what happened was the price of wheat, the price of corn, the price of pork, it all skyrocketed because there was a huge need to feed the armies of both the United States and Europe. Um, what happened was prices went sky high, but when the war ended, prices fell, fell very, very low. And so all these farmers that had bought all these really nice um, pieces of equipment, uh, tractors and automated uh, equipment that helped them um, uh, do more with less, uh, now they can't do that and they have to pay for them, okay? So anyway, um, what, what happens is farmers began plowing more and more land. And when they did that, it's one thing to plow more land as long as you're getting more and more moisture. And it's another thing to do that if there's ever a kind of a drought. And so what happens in the plains, places like West Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, is that there is a severe drought in the mid-1930s. And because all of this land had been plowed, it had been exposed, uh, the heat baked it. And when the, the wind picked up, it would just blow it every which way. It's called the Dust Bowl. And what it basically amounts to is a really severe case of soil erosion, okay? Now, there's very little that the president can do when it comes to restoring the soil, but what the, what the, what, what the earth really needs is a break from farmers farming it, okay? So what Roosevelt does in the mid-1930s is starts this New Deal organization called the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. And what it does is it puts young Americans to work doing things like planting trees, uh, um, fixing up um, uh, old wetlands, uh, generally doing things that give the, um, give the land a break. I mean, there are thousands and thousands of acres that uh, were once upon a time owned by private farmers that are bought up uh, during the New Deal era and are now federally owned fields. And what the CCC would do is either plant trees or plant grass. And uh, what the grass and the trees and the vegetation generally did is not only replenish the soil, it made it much more difficult for the wind to pick up and just blow the soil uh, all over the place. So let me put a final cap, final thought on uh, what we've been learning thus far. What you've got in the 1930s is a political transition. It begins in 1932 when the Democratic Party replaces the Republican Party when it comes to the dominant political group in American politics, right? Up into 1932, it had been the Republicans, and now it's the Democrats. At the core of this political transition is an alliance of voters that I need you to be mindful of called the New Deal Coalition. Now, the coalition, the alliance, it consisted of groups like organized labor, it consisted of groups like African Americans, who had generally voted Republican up until 1932. It consisted of immigrants, of city dwellers, uh, to a lesser extent uh, farmers uh, in the South and in the West. And all of these voters are voting Democrat. And this is a real hodgepodge. It's an eclectic group of Americans that are all voting for the same party, and in some cases, the same politicians. And Franklin Roosevelt really is in, at the center of this New Deal coalition. Now, the reason that the New Deal coalition is so important is not just that it was this collection of voters that were in this alliance. The New Deal coalition is going to last for over three decades. It's not really going to be until 1968 that you see this New Deal coalition that began all the way back in 1932, so more than 30 years. Not going to be until 1968 that you really begin to see that come apart. Now, in the next video installment, what we're going to be talking about is the culture that emerges in the 1930s, which is very much reflective of the times and takes its cues in a lot of ways from, uh, um, um, from, from the emergence of the New Deal.